coach and consultant. Uh, so a little about me. Um, let me see, where to begin? Uh, I worked at Microsoft for 15 years, so I worked at Microsoft for a long time. And uh, the last product I shipped in was, you ready for this? Windows Vista. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah, I did leave. And <laughs> then I went to a work for a guy named Steve McConnell. And uh, what I started to do for Steve was travel the world and help people with their agile transformations. So that's all I do. I do agile coaching, agile consulting, agile training. And I'm actually headquartered out of Sydney, Australia now. So uh, part of what I like to do is go to conferences and meet people just like you, uh, go to cool talks and learn. And I like to give back by giving talks myself. For, so for me, this is a labor of love and I hope you love this presentation too. So that's me. Uh, the session we're going to do today is the end is nigh, signs of transformation apocalypse. I've seen a lot of transformations. I've helped in a lot of transformations. Some have succeeded and some have failed. But I've seen a lot of things go badly. A lot of things go badly. And in fact, uh, the signs you're going to see today are sticky note signs, which is appropriate for a natural conference. So let's get started. Let's talk about the end of the world. Here are the warning signs every Agile coach needs to look out for as they go through an Agile transformation. The first one, the Iron Triangle. This is the whole reason Agile was invented, to get out of the Iron Triangle, right? Fixed scope, fixed resources, fixed time. And you're asked to come into a client to do an Agile transformation, right? And what's the first thing they do? They fix your scope, they fix your time, <laughs> right? And they fix your budget. And then they write a contract, right? The Agile transformation must be complete by so-and-so date. And then they give you all these metrics, right? We need 20% uh, more efficiency. We need 30% less employees. Our satisfaction, <laughs> ironically, needs to be higher, right? This is the classic transformation that's stuck in the iron triangle. That's your first warning sign. If you go into a client and it's all about a contract, an SOW, about an agile transformation with everything fixed right off the bat, you know that the end is nigh. The agency provider. You've come into an organization and they're looking to transform and what they're probably going to mention is something called a digital transformation, right? So they've gone out and they've hired the coolest digital agency in town. And they all have mustaches like this. Curly mustaches and beards. And they look like hipsters because they're hipsters, right? All they do is program, uh, you know, mobile apps all day and they do responsive websites and they say they do digital transformations. But they don't really know much about Agile and they've been contracted to come into a company and do a transformation. But they're not Agile specialists. They're specialists in providing digital products. That's the next sign that the end is nigh if you're working with a digital agency and not somebody who specializes in Agile transformations. Now conversely, there's the corporate consultancy. Uh, these are ironically at the two ends of the spectrum, right? The cool consultancy and the corporate consultancy. Uh, they both have deliverables of uh, usually slide decks. The corporate consultancy, it's the perfect slide deck. The more slides, the better. A hundred words a slide, but the agency slide deck, it looks cool, but they both have the same kind of end result rather than being agile and leading a transformation, the output is what's considered to be most important. So the corporate consultancy is outputting slide decks like crazy. Slide decks, slide decks, slide decks. The more words, the better. Like they're getting paid by the word. That's the next big indicator that a transformation apocalypse is coming. When you're working with a large consultancy and all they care about is producing documents. Cool frameworks. You walk into a situation, 
you're talking to the client, they're talking about a natural transformation, and they start talking about cool frameworks. And we all know what those cool frameworks are, don't we? I'll give you some keywords to help you with this one. There's your keywords, right? How many times have you heard this over the past five years? If I hear the word tribe or guild or squad one more time, right? Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, it means the company has kind of fixated on like a cool thing. It sounds awesome. It sounds different. But it's been around for ages. It's gotten to the point where I hear uh, tribes, squads, and guilds, and it's just, it's just trite. It doesn't have any more meaning anymore, right? Uh, I was just in a talk over there, and they were talking about Valve's cabals, right? Why did Valve come up with the word cabal? It's because all the other cool words were taken, right? That's a key indicator that you're headed towards transformation apocalypse, because they're starting to use cool terms, because they think it makes them better somehow. These are the other keywords you should be looking out for. Spotify, Google. Uh, when your transformation says, we should be like someone else, is essentially what it comes down to. It, Spotify and Google are the classic examples. Uh, we're going to use the Spotify model. We're going to be Spotify. Well, you're not actually Spotify, because that's the name of the company, right? Uh, the other one I hear is Google. Like, we're going to do Google design sprints and stuff like that. Right? There's other things out there like this. Um, it's kind of like the company or the transformation team has said, uh, this company over here that's really awesome has done all the hard work. Now we can just do what they did and it's going to be super easy and we'll be cool like them too. That's essentially what they're saying. They're saying they've done all the hard work. Now we can do, all, do everything they've done and we'll be just like them. Rather than thinking about how they could do it themselves how they could make their own company way of doing, they're just stealing it from someone else. The enterprise frameworks, remember the, uh, the cool digital agency consultancy and the enterprise agency? Well, there's two ends of the spectrum, right? If you have cool frameworks, then you must have enterprise frameworks as well. Uh, so what are some of the enterprise framework keywords that you need to look out for? as a coach, as a transformation agent. Yeah, as soon as I hear these words, I know something could be up. Train, RTE, PI, safe. Uh, it's very similar to the, um, to the uh, cool frameworks with the tribe, squad, guild, they, uh, client, uh, is interested in those because they sound cool. They are interested in these because they sound enterprise. Ooh, RTE, that's an acronym. It's got three letters in it. It's got to be good. PI, they should have kept it PSI. It used to be called PSI. I think they should have kept it PSI because it has three letters, and acronyms are better with three letters. Although SAFE has four, so maybe that's, maybe that's the best acronym up there. I don't know. But these are keywords that indicate once again, that the organization has said, here's something we can just do right off the shelf, like it's software. Oh, we'll just go to the uh, enterprise framework store, and we'll pull the safe box off the shelf, and we'll install safe in the organization. And then we'll configure it, right? They're, they're thinking like, uh, like an agile transformation with all the culture and mindset changes involved can be configured like software. That's how they see it, right? They look at the safe diagram. It's got a place for everyone. It's got multiple levels. Oh, it's so cool, right? It just puts everything out there and tells you everything to do. That's the problem. It tells you everything to do. It totally short circuits the learning process of going through an actual transformation. So if you're in a situation where you see these keywords, you might be in trouble. The end could be nigh. If you've ever been involved in a transformation where you see people getting laid off or made redundant, ooh, that's a big clue that something could be going on. I once worked at a client where uh, their business justification for the transformation was, 
we need to lay off 20% of the staff. They didn't care who they laid off. Well, I guess they did. They probably wanted to lay off the people who earn more. But that's all they really cared about in the Agile transformation. That was their business goal. We want to save money by firing 20% of our people. That's why we're doing an Agile transformation. That's not the point of an Agile transformation, right? The point of an Agile transformation is taking an organization through a journey and then letting people figure out how they fit in the journey, whether or not they belong there, where they belong, if they should go elsewhere. You let the people in the organization figure that out. The people will figure it out. But if it's just a cost-saving measure, then that's not going to end well for your transformation. Those transformations fail, and then they do another one after that. There's no psychological safety. Secrecy. If your transformation is a secret transformation, that's a bad, bad, bad sign. You've got the transformation team room. It's in the back of the office. I've had clients like actually put stuff over the windows so the employees can't see into the room because there's secret transformation going on in there, right? There's secret Kanban boards and secret designs and secret decks and all the transformation people on the transformation team come into work every day and they go into their secret transformation room and they work in there all day, probably on slide decks, right? Ooh, the secret transformation slide deck. And people, regular people, the employees are not allowed into the room because it's secret. And you ask, why do we have to keep it a secret? And they say stuff like, well, our people just aren't ready for it, right? They'll say, they're not ready for it. They can't handle the truth right now. They'll say something like that, right? Like it's, like it's their fault they can't handle the truth, right? Transparency is, is non-existent. Coach isolation. If you're the only Agile coach in an organization and on a transformation team, and you're surrounded by project managers, you're probably in trouble, right? You're the only Agile coach and you're surrounded by project managers or program managers, right? How are you supposed to have an Agile transformation with one Agile person in the room? That's really, really tough. You, as the Agile coach, are going to feel isolated. In fact, they are isolating you because you're dangerous. You say crazy things like, we should let the people decide how to do it. They don't like that. That's, that's crazy. They want to figure out the transformation for the people, right? So they get a bunch of project managers, a bunch of program managers. They put them in the secret transformation room, and then they design the transformation in slide decks. Ooh, the organization should look like this. Uh, that person should do that. We'll take all the BAs and convert them to product owners. We'll take all the project managers and convert them to scrum masters. And you're the lone agile coach in the room saying crazy things like, we should let the guys, the teams figure this out. And they look at you like you're crazy. And after a while, you as the agile coach, you start to go crazy because you're the only one and you're surrounded by these waterfall people. A scrum transformation team. Oh boy, how many transformation teams have I been on where they try to run at scrum, right? The theory is if you have a transformation team that runs as scrum, then you're modeling that scrummy, agile behavior to the rest of the organization. That means you have sprint planning, you have daily stand-ups, you have retrospectives, you had reviews, you have refining sessions, you've got a Kanban board on the back of the room for your transformation team, and you have tickets and you're moving them across, just like a real scrum team. Except it is the worst scrum team ever. Right? Because nobody shows up to any of the scrum meetings because the Scrum Transformation team is like 5% of their real job. 
They come to like one stand-up every two weeks. They don't come to the retrospectives. They don't do any of the work. And your scrum board's sitting in the back of the secret transformation room, and no one's looking at it, and the tickets don't move. If you have a scrum transformation team, then that's a definite sign, because scrum transformation teams are the worst scrum teams. And a waterfall agile transformation. Uh, you mentioned this earlier, uh, Scott, right? Let's plan out the perfect transformation. I had a client where I spent nine months on the ground planning the perfect transformation. Never happened. The first three months, all I did was talk to people, assess them. You know, that's like the requirements gathering. The next three months, we sat in the secret transformation room, and we did the design, which is the slide decks, right? I had the client tell me, Alex, you're doing a great job, but you, you need to bring up your slide output, right? And we need more words per slide. So there was like a slide velocity, right? That's what it was. That's all they cared about. That was the output. And I would say, why don't we just do something? And they, they would say stuff like, no, no, the people aren't ready. We got to have everything perfect before we actually do it. Nine months later, I go to the client and I said, I could have spun up a scrum team once a week for nine months. And you would like, have 30 operational scrum teams by now who would be constantly learning and changing and adapting. The transformation, we'd already be into the next level of the transformation, but they hadn't even started because it was a waterfall transformation. They had to get everything perfect. Just do it. Just do it. And if you have a PM on the transformation team, you know you're in trouble, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was at a client recently, and they had a traditional project manager on the team, on the transformation team, because it was a fixed bid project. It was a waterfall agile transformation, which just boggles the mind. It's crazy. Why would you run an Agile transformation with Waterfall and have a project manager on it? And once you get a project manager on an Agile transformation team, certain things are going to happen that you're all familiar with, that we all lived through in the old days before we became Agile. The very word transformation itself is kind of a warning sign. Is it a transformation? Maybe it's an installation, configuration, adoption, journey? I'm not sure, but the whole word transformation kind of has some baggage associated with it. How many of you have gone through an agile transformation? Just show your hands. How many have been in an agile transformation? That's a good percentage of the room, yeah. I wonder what that really means, agile transformation. I think if you're a coach, you should be thinking about what transformation actually means to the, to the business sponsors, to the business. What does that word really mean? And boy, Gantt charts. If you're on an agile transformation team and you're producing Gantt charts, it's not looking good for you, right? You're on the transformation team in your secret room, and the project manager of the transformation team comes to you and says, we need a Gantt chart. And you're the Agile coach. And you're like, there's a backlog right there. There's a backlog right there. No, 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 Gantt chart. Got to have a Gantt chart for our Agile transformation. Otherwise, how do we know when we're transformed? Right? How do we know? We got we to gotta be transformed by this date. The Gantt chart's the only way to do it. Yeah, if you start producing Gantt charts in your Agile transformation, definitely you could be in big trouble. The end might be nigh, yeah. And reports, oh yeah. Gantt charts is just the start of your Agile transformation because next thing you know, you're producing stoplight reports, right? <laughs> Here's the status of our Agile transformation. Once a week, just like 1997, 
here's what we're doing. Here's what we've done. Uh, it's red, amber, green. All right. Once you start getting into the mode of producing reports and Gantt charts, uh, it's the same thing, just like an individual scrum team, an individual Kanban team, the same applies. All those principles apply to a transformation team. And if you start doing it on a transformation team, then that kind of behavior is embedded in the organization. It's, you're in serious trouble. Now, you bring up all these risks, these impediments, these warnings, these behaviors, because this is what agile coaches do, right? We're just fancy scrum masters, and what do scrum masters do? They bring up impediments, and then they try to solve them, right? They try to crush them. They try to overcome impediments. So it's your job as a person on the transformation team. It's your job as a scrum master in a, in a transformation. It's your job as an agile coach in a transformation team or in a big transformation at an enterprise or a startup to bring these things up so that you can solve them, right? All these anti-patterns I've shown you here today, if you've ever been involved in a transformation, you've probably seen some of these. And if you've done a lot of transformations, you've probably seen consistent patterns in all the things I've just mentioned. And you bring it up to your executives. What, what happens when you bring these things up to the people above you in the organization where the transformation is happening? What do you think happens to you, the Agile coach? Let's see, I'll show you what happens. That's you. Yeah. Yeah. Get prepared to die. Right? Because they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that stuff. They are just used to doing the way that, that they're doing things already. And if you bring up these warnings, these, these things, these anti-patterns, if they're not truly on board, if they're not truly interested in transforming, then you're going to die. You'll either quit or they'll fire you. And this is why Agile coaches are always prepared with an up-to-date LinkedIn profile. <laughs> because you're doing crazy things, right? Uh, ironically, some of the clients I go to, uh, the business sponsor, you know, they hire me in, I, they bring me in, and they're so happy to have me come, and they take me out to dinner, and oh, they're so excited. Oh, we love you, Alex, you're gonna change our world. And then the next day, and then the next week, and the next month, who's the person that fights me the most and is the hardest person to change? It's the person who hired me. They want the change, but they don't want the change, right? I want the change, no, I don't want the change. And you could end up dead. You could end up dead. But that's our job as Agile coaches. You should always be prepared to be killed because you're pushing the organization past boundaries that they didn't know that they had, that they needed to overcome. It's very risky for you as the Agile coach, right? And if you're not pushing them that hard, and by push, I don't mean like telling them what to do, but by like building the space and challenging them in constructive, healthy, honest ways, then you're not doing your job. So what do you do? What do you do as an Agile coach, as a transformation agent, as a person on a transformation team, when you're working in an Agile transformation? What do you do when you see all of these anti-patterns, all of these signs that disaster is about to come? What do you do? I don't know. I don't have the answers. You'll have to figure out the answers. Just like your transformation, just like your client should be figuring out the answers themselves, how to do a transformation, you need to do the same thing. And it's going to be different every single time. You can't just do a transformation by saying we're doing Spotify. You can't do it just by saying we're doing Google. You can't do it just by saying we're doing safe or whatever it is. 
you have to figure out what works for your context. Not only for the transformation, but for you as a coach, which means you're gonna have to overcome all these challenges I'm bringing up, and more. There are more challenges beyond these. These are just the ones I brought up for today. There are many, many, many more. So the deck is available right here. The link to the deck is in the deck. Oh, wait, I'm pointing it the wrong way. There you go. Now, the reason I made the deck this way is because I don't want it to look like an Agile transformation deck, right? I want it to look like a mindset and cultural deck. So there's the deck for you. You can go check it out. Those are some very consistent Annie patterns. And thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Now, I've left plenty of time for questions. What questions do you guys have? Yeah, you, sir. Organizations oh. which are actually going through agile transformation. Yeah, yeah. One of the key questions that I keep getting from a senior leadership team right. is in terms of there is a reason for why we are transforming. Right. How do we see the results of the transformation? Right. The whole intent of transformation is to drive certain results. Right. Uh, because the company is not making right revenue, because the company needs to move towards new areas, whatever those results are. What is what is the how do I define the end result of a transformation? Yeah, okay. So I'll let you in on a secret. You ready for this secret? <clears throat> okay, here it is. You should use Agile in your Agile transformation. That's the secret. You know how you have like a sprint zero for a scrum team and you get together, you build a team and you build together a backlog? That's all you do for a transformation team. You build a transformation team and you do a kickoff and you build a transformation backlog and it's as easy as that. And that's one of the things in the transformation backlog. It usually like up near the top, that's one of the first things you do is you figure out what the, the business purpose is and then you attack that as a, as a backlog item for your transformation. It might be, I've seen business uh, like goals that weren't numbers at all. Like I've done transformations at company companies where they just said, we want our employees to be happier. There was no numbers. But I've been at other places where they said stuff like, we want our efficiency be, to be 20% more, right? So then in that case, uh, what we did is we just baseline what our efficiency was then, then, and then we measured it later. You know, basically we assessed it and then assessed it after the transformation. I guess what I'm trying to say is figure out what your business goals are and then figure out how to measure them if you even need to based on what they are. And it's just an item in your transformation backlog. So the follow-up question is that once you baseline the yeah. business goal and then you know the target in terms of what Correct. you want to accomplish. That's right. Then the need of the report starts coming in. Yeah, yeah. To see how this is. Because it yeah. is, what I was able to relate to exactly what you were saying right. and how this actually moves you into that area of uh, getting into non-agile mode. Yeah. How do we tackle that kind of a situation? Definitely, just like any other Scrum team, you want to get your stakeholders engaged. So you see a, the classic Annie pattern where stakeholders want to know how a Scrum team is doing, so they get sent reports. It's probably because they're not coming to the demo and they're not getting engaged. It's the same with your executive leadership. If they're truly engaged at that personal level with the transformation team, then they don't really need reports. They should be getting it live in real time all the time. Sure. Thank you. Oh, other questions? Uh, so first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. It My pleasure. really exciting. Uh, so one of the first things that we have discussed is the iron triangle, right? Where yeah. you get a project, you'll have a scope defined, yeah. you will have timelines defined, yeah. and you will have resources and all getting sorted, right? Of course. Uh, could you please share in, uh, you know, a scenario in which you have dealt with it or, you know, probably an example? Where yeah. you have helped an organization to come out of the iron triangle? Yeah, yeah. So one of the classic ways to do it is to actually do separate contracts. Uh, so uh, in the old days uh, when I was doing SOW stuff for a creative agency, rather than doing an SOW for the entire project or a transformation project, what you would do is contractually split it up into chunks. So you would, you would essentially buy like velocity 
and say at the end of this SOW period, which might only be four weeks, you'll get these certain things. Then we rewrite a new SOW. So essentially what you're doing is you're iterating on SOWs. Rather than doing one giant fixed bid project, you're doing small little incremental iterative SOWs that basically are uh, all around buying velocity and uh, not fixed outcomes. Definitely, it's a shared partnership. Uh, I've found personally that setting up that kind of a arrangement with clients that you don't have a trusting relationship can be quite hard. But doing that with clients you have a trusting relationship with is a lot easier to accomplish. So if you do have clients where you have that relationship, you'll probably have better results. Alex, yeah. I'm curious to know, when the person who hired you didn't want to change, what did you do? Number one. And number two, if you can tell us some scenarios where you have succeeded in changing the mindset of leaders, oh. as well as you have failed, miserably failed, in changing the mindset of leaders. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so the question is, have, uh, how have I dealt with clients who've hired me but don't really want me? <laughs> right? Uh, I've actually had clients, uh, uh, I could tell you a story later over beer. It was a horrible, horrible client. I showed up on the first day and nobody showed up to my workshop. And I sat in the workshop for two hours by myself while nobody showed up. That was a terrible client. Uh, I can tell you what I did with that client. I fired them. I basically said on the phone, I'm never coming back here. Click, right? Because I felt like deceived, right? Um, a very common practice for people to uh, practice is like an agile contract, like an agile transformation contract. There are lots of people out in the agile community who actually get a client to sign a contract before they agree to come in and do a transformation. And it's not like an SOW, like work kind of contract, it's more like a social contract. If I come and agree to work with you, then you have to promise to be nice and do what I say and stuff like that. So uh, that's a very common practice. Um, I, would on, I usually only employ that when I feel like I'm kind of like skeptical of the person, right? And you want to go through some kind of formal, you know, setting of expectations. Uh, changing hearts and minds is uh, really uh, a long-term hard practice. Um, my advice to you, and, and I have been successful in places and certain places not, uh, my advice to you is to be authentically you, uh, be cautiously optimistic, uh, lead the way with uh, gentle, honest, um, reflection and advice and mentoring and coaching and teaching. Um, every transformation I've seen where the transformation was forced on people and forced on the organization because they were told what to do by some agile consultant has not ended well. So you have to be like a, um, like a loving, guiding person and not a telling person. And over time, it will succeed and work. Uh, microphone. Uh, my question is, uh, it's the transformation objective itself when yeah. it comes from the top down. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've understood that the more specific it becomes, the difficult it it leaves the whole of the organization to navigate around. Yeah. Uh, and the more sort of vague it becomes, it it it, it has more space to navigate. But at the same time. Is there some sort of a sweet spot wherein the organization does know what it wants, oh. but has given a leverage uh, wow. to, for the teams to do it? That's a great question. And in fact, I actually implied it, but didn't state it explicitly in my presentation. When I talked about the agency versus the uh, large consultancy, and when I talked about the cool frameworks and the enterprise frameworks, what I was really implying was that there's a range, and that somewhere in between is the sweet spot that you have to find that you're talking about. 
So uh, my assertion is that every single Agile transformation is unique and needs to be considered in the context of which it is occurring, and then you need to adjust it and adapt and learn through that Agile transformation in that actual context, uh, which is basically the definition of Agile, right? So always go back to Agile. A transformation team and a transformation is nothing more or nothing less than an Agile project. Probably Kanban, right? And you're gonna inspect and adapt. You're just gonna do stuff and then see what happens. And that's the quickest and easiest way to do a transformation. Did I answer your question? All right, more questions. Any more questions? Oh, well we got a, yeah. do you mind running the mic over? So people generally are, or rather most of the people are of following mentality. Work is just work. And they don't want to think too much. <laughs> right? Yeah. But here we are trying to encourage everybody to think yes. for themselves. Correct. Right. Uh, how practical do you think it is? Because there are some people who are real leaders who do want to put their thoughts into it. Yeah. But most of the people, they are just like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yeah, generally there are uh, leaders uh, kind of paving the way in the organization for a transformation. A uh, very common practice is to go into a transformation and assess the people and figure out the natural leaders and champions for the Agile transformation. And essentially you turn them into lightning rods or focal points uh, for uh, helping transform the org. They sometimes end up on the transformation team itself, right? You identify the champions or paladins or whatever you want to call them and they go on the transformation team. There are people who will just follow. Uh, and that's perfectly fine, right? It's like having introverts on a team. You can't change the nature of an introvert, just like you can't change the nature of someone who wants to follow. Uh, but focus on your strengths in your, or in your organization and amplify them. Identify those key people who are interested in taking the org to the next agile level, and then invest in them and enable them to be the best they can be and to lead, uh, help lead the others. And the others will follow, right? If only because their followers. But if you give them somebody to follow, then they will follow. What we're essentially saying is that the change leaders, the leaders are change agents, yes. need to be the thinkers. Yes. And the rest will follow. They're inspirational, visionary leaders. Right. You as the Agile coach should go into the organization, be a visionary leader, uh, model that behavior, and then the other, other visionary leaders, you, you figure out who those, those people are and you build a, you build a support group. Now, when I talked about coach isolation, uh, that's when you're in, by yourself in the, in the transformation room and there's nobody willing to help you, nobody cares. There might be nobody in the organization who wants to be a champion. I've even uh, gone to a client where I identified the champions, brought them into the transformation team, and then the client behind my back told all those people, no, 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 you can't be agile champions. You're not good enough. And I was like, what? These are your best people, right? So, and then they went away, and then I said, do you want to be Agile champions anymore? And they said, hell no, we don't want to be Agile champions, right? Because they went behind their backs and said they couldn't be. So you need to have that strong sponsorship, that strong leadership that brings you in. Uh, essentially, my, my position is that as an Agile coach, if you're going and doing a transformation, if you don't have strong executive leadership from a business sponsor, then you are in big trouble. It will fail without that. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, Alex, uh, suppose the, uh, uh, as a, a transformation lead, uh, I have just started the agile uh, transformation, but uh, after some time, I lose the momentum. Oh, yeah. And the people lose the interest of that because it's not... Uh, they are not uh, uh, able to visualize the result or benefits of this process. Right, right, right. The how I can maintain those momentum. Yeah, so to maintain the momentum is to come right out of the gate as fast as you can. So rather than, than doing a slow, low, uh, long, slow transformation, do it as quickly as possible and just hit it right out of the gate. 
as quickly as possible so that they can start to see change and benefits immediately. Now, if you're in a situation where it's been nine months and nothing much has happened, you might have to reboot your entire transformation. And that's what a lot of companies go through. Uh, large enterprises you hear about that go through multiple transformations, all they're doing is just long sequences of transformations. Nine months, nine months, nine months, nine months. And they do it again and again and again because they're slow. If they just did it as quickly as possible, messy and quick, one time they might be able to kickstart their entire culture back into a, a mode of learning. I've actually, uh, talked to other coaches uh, and been involved in trans transformations myself where they're like on their seventh transformation. And they're like running out of acronyms. I'll give you an example. Uh, wow is really hot. And uh, there's a company in Australia right now that's like on their seventh version of wow. So they're running out of wows. They were. And wow, and then e wow, and then x wow, and now they're like, what wow should we use now, right? Because they've like run out of wows. Next, next wow, wow plus plus, I don't know, right? It's just because that company just can't get out of that mode of long, big transformations. Yeah, so kick it off hard and fast like a real scrum team. Yeah. Other questions? There's a mic here. So it's a continuation of what he was asking. Yeah. If you are, <coughs> sorry, if you are hired in the middle of a transformation journey, yeah, yeah. Okay, it is almost like uh, going on in a crisis mode and yeah. uh, it's a deep red and uh, there is no way it will succeed yeah. kind of scenario. Yeah. And the leadership team uh, doesn't want to start all over <laughs> again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, in that scenario, what is your advice? Where oh. do you start? That's a tough question. I'm trying to think of situations where I've encountered that myself personally. Um, I have come into organizations where they've gone through a transformation. Uh, transformation is kind of a slippery word because it, there's like no end, right? So when, do, when is it when you're really coming into a transformation or not? I don't know. But I have come into organizations that are along their journey, their transformation, and it's just a continuation. Uh, you're talking about a situation where I probably wouldn't join the team in the first place, right? Where I'd say, I'd probably talk to people and say, ooh, what's going on here? And if, if I feel like they're not, not in it, heart and soul, then I won't join in, essentially. I mean, I love a good fight, and I love helping hard situations get better, but there's some situations that are just, you're not going to win. You're just not. And, you know, you're going to end up one night at home, in bed, crying, eating ice cream or whatever. You don't want to be there. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, over here. Uh, do you have a mic? Hi, I'm Ashish. Uh, my question is uh, an extension to the question which the gentleman asked. Sure. At what point do you see the transformation is safe enough that the team would not wish to go back? Oh. How do you conclude that it's enough? There will, there will always be uh, some pros, guys yeah. who would be in favor. Yeah. Most of them would be sitting on the fence. Yeah. Some would be dead against. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you see the benefits. There are challenges. You are in a transformation phase. Yeah. And there will be people who would always would like to go back. Sure. Yeah, what is the point where you say, this is where I have reached. There is no way they will go back again. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question because I have an actual answer for that. Uh, there is a, an eternal question all agilists talk about late at night at the bar when they're drinking beer. And that question is, I wonder... Could a scrum team be so mature that they don't need a scrum master? Right? We've all heard that question. And in theory, in a perfect scrummy world where everything is scrummy goodness, 
you could, in theory, have a team that was so good, it didn't need a scrum master. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, I haven't either. So my experience is that when you come into an organization, when you come into a team and they say, we don't need any coaches anymore. We don't need any scrum masters anymore. We're so good. We're like done. We're next level. We're like wow plus eight, right? That's a key indicator right then and there that they are not ready, right? If they say it, if they say it, it means they're not. So the converse is true. It's the organizations and the teams that are constantly asking themselves, how can we get better? And maybe we do need help. I think those are the ones that are actually more mature than the ones who say we don't need help. That's my position. Thank you. Yeah. More questions. Oh, we got, oh, oh we got one right there. Oh, we got one. Hello. Yeah. We got one over here, but we'll get to you next. Uh, yeah, actually, I keep hearing that uh, most of the agile transitions are failures. Approximately, I hear the numbers from 30 percentage to even 75 percentage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. yeah. But I've never heard that people who have uh, really, I don't know what exactly is meant by that failure part, because uh, we all talk about continuous improvement and everything else. Yeah. But then, uh, I don't know, is it really that they don't go back to, uh, they, they want to go back to the uh, traditional way of <laughs> waterfall? I, uh, what is that failure here? I really don't understand what is the failure here. Yeah, yeah. How, how much time do we have left? One minute? Oh, we're over one minute. Come find me out there, I'll tell you out there. <laughs> we're over one minute. I'll come find you later, too. But right, thank you for all the questions. I love the questioning. That was really great. I'll see you guys out there, and we'll have a beer later. All right, bye.